delighted to see you and to hear from you as well. Yes, so let's start our panel discussion now. And we can see that a few people have just joined again. So I have introduced the speakers and the subject in detail. But let me do a very quick recap on the panelists, very quick recap on the panelists and the uh, topic. It's by Women in Management. The topic of the discussion is the heart of resilient leadership. The panel comprises of six speakers. I'll be leading and moderating the panel. I'm Medha Diyalvis, a lawyer and a journalist. We have Honorable Iran Vikramaratna, Member of Parliament, Felix Fernando, Group Director, Omega Line, Gany Subramaniam, Chief Executive Officer, Alliance Insurance, Sarah Twig, Women in Work of the International Finance Corporation, and last but not the least, Shehara De Silva, Managing Director, Nectarins Group. Yes, let's start. Shihara, I would like to hear from you first. You are from a field which is renowned for logistics, shipping, and the supply chain. And now youth leadership has taken a new turn. It's very digital now. Discussions are digital, strategies are adopted digital, and also there are so many employment issues, pay cuts, employment cuts, etc. that's happening. Please enlighten us about your industry of shipping, logistics, and supply chain. What are the, like we know the challenges that have been uh, faced by all industries. What have been your best practices and how have you kept your teams motivated and driven a company, a big company to achieve profits? Shahara. Thank you, Meida. And thank you, Women in Management and Zalochana for having me. Um, yeah, just to start off with, I think um, in this pandemic situation, the first thing that happens is uncertainty. There's uncertainty everywhere for the staff, for our customers, for our service providers. Um, and that creates a lot of anxiety, creates a lot of unknowns. So as a leader, I think the first thing that we had to do or I had to do was give that confidence to my uh, teams. A confidence that yes, we are you. We are not going to cut uh, headcount. We're not going to cut your salaries. Uh, we're going to still pay. We're going to. So this kind of confidence is the first thing that we had to do and give strategy, give direction. So after sort of stabilizing that way, because shipping and logistics, as you mentioned, um, we are a diversified group of companies, and shipping and logistics is our core business. So it is an essential service and we had to work right throughout the pandemic and we had to ensure that all the imports and exports were cleared. And um, we had to, of course, digitalize. That was one thing um, that had to be, it, we were forced to innovate that way because our industry is fairly traditional. Support is traditional, customs are traditional. We use a lot of paperwork. And I think even today we are still using paperwork, but um, we, there, there was uh, the delivery order, which is one of the main documents in the import process. We were managed to make that digital. So that was a big step. And I think this pandemic forced innovation. It forced teams to think differently. And we gave the impetus as leaders to go ahead. And um, that, uh, that, whole, that whole drive resulted in a lot of change and resulted in, in the daily workflow still happening. We had right. to... Uh, segregate our offices, for example, make sure that, you know, if one person was uh, infected, that it wouldn't spread to the other departments. So there's a lot of out-of-the-box out of thinking. We had to rearrange, uh, have remote officers, work from home, uh, be it um, really, really think out of the box and innovate. Uh, so that's one of the main things that really took us, right. took us through this. Right. right. Shara, that's very interesting. Can you give me one example that you experienced now when you were having these remote officers or sometimes the people would be infected, etc. I'm sure you would have found situations where the workers were demotivated. Let's talk about, for example, the young leaders, the mid-level management, demotivated. Can you give us one example, I'm sure you have many, of how you managed to bring them back into power to encourage them? Kindly share with us an example of how you and your senior management did that. Sure. 
yeah, I think um, one thing is so many, I, I will give you small, some small, a lot of small examples. I think that would be a lot more interesting to the one, listener. One, just one at the moment, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, one, okay. So uh, apart from just like going out of our way to be human and really helping the families of those infected staff, you know, with supplying them with rations, you know, uh, we arrange from the company uh, 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 PCR facilities and the, uh, what do you call it, the private um, healthcare facilities, all of that. Apart from that, uh, per se in the business itself, there was, we had one company which, which went through a huge loss because, uh, because of the oil price crash. We had acquired some stocks uh, prior to COVID, which was at a very high level. And this loss went into millions of dollars because the pr oil price crashed and the staff were very demotivated. And they were, but we as leaders, I think we then we spoke to each and everyone and said, we understand the situation and it's tough for us. It's tough for you guys, but we are going to keep going. Even if it's going to lose us millions to keep selling, we are going to keep selling. We're going to buy another quantity and we're going to continue trading. So we gave them that confidence. Look, Life must go on. We can't just stop operations, close up, uh, and 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 go home. So I think this is this took a lot of courage as a leader, and uh, because we even we didn't know if it, it was going to be okay. We didn't. We just had no choice but to keep going. So today the company has revived, and uh, they are, uh, I must say, doing okay. So I think that courage to give them that confidence to keep going was also very important. And apart from that, like I said earlier looking into their personal requirements, so even the drivers who, did, who missed out on their OT. We have looked at, you know, supplementing that and personally checking in with lots of, like I personally checked in with every, all my senior management, there were about five people who got infected. I personally checked in with them, WhatsApp them, are you okay? So that kind of personal uh, moral support also went a long way because those guys are now back in action, they're working. Right. And that really helped the company to turn around. Sure. That's awesome, Shahara. I'm sure that it was a lot of hard work and has been paying very well. Great. Felix, what about you? What were your best practices in your field? And also, how have you, because before the panel discussion, you were sharing with me intense details about how you managed to get education, how you managed to get insight into some other segments that we did not know earlier because the situation had changed with COVID-19. So I would like to know what were the situations like that that you felt you should get insight into and what are the insights you got in your business during this time to make it a success story? What are your success stories? Yeah, thank you, Meda. Welcome everyone. And thanks again for uh, inviting me for this uh, discussion. Uh, as some of you are aware that, you know, we come from an apparel business where it is, we do have in our companies about, about 14,000 people working and out of that 90% are women. So it's, I think, uh, it's uh, maybe a very good example to discuss here as well. So how we have been is, you know, I would simply say that, you know, the way that we have handled, uh, it was amazing. I would say we, not I, because we were able to get a lot of support from all the uh, staff members, from the even the machine operator upward. Um, see, we have operations in five locations: Waunia, Sandalankao, Badalgama, Bingiria, and Bolga Havela. And uh, it's huge numbers. So last year March, when we close, when we had to close the factories for the first time. So we were, our first objective was, you know, to make sure, you know, convincing even the health authorities, it's an it's a unknown thing. People were not knowing what this disease is, what, what kind of uh, the, uh, the severity of this uh, issue or the sickness, you know, what will be the... So we, we were just struggling to, first, to get ourselves educated. And with that one, we have seen certain things which are done by the regulators, the policy makers, which are incorrect, which are not logical, illogical. So that's where we had to uh, uh, make a lot of efforts to get this thing corrected, you know, to run the economy while controlling the, uh, this epidemic. So uh, 
I was part and parcel of uh, the apparel association and the JAFA as well, the Joint Apparel Association Forum. So with, along with that, you know, I we had to do a lot of uh, representation to the government, government authorities, just to get the uh, get things going. You know, because we had a lot of export orders, we can't take the risk of uh, getting these things uh, lost for the uh, country's uh, foreign foreign exchange reserves. Tourism was gone. Uh, we had a lot of problems, issues with also the uh, employment income coming from the, the migrant workers. So we were just uncertainty, like Shara earlier mentioned. So um, good thing is that, you know, then also we were able to, during this pandemic, even in starting from March, even, even everybody's at home uh, panicking, but we were able to, from our company, together with the, some association companies, we were able to get from each company, he said, 40 to 50 people to come every day to contribute to a national uh, task that is to uh, make face masks. So, nice. from our company, we were able to do about 750,000 face masks. Uh, yeah, 750,000 face masks. And uh, that was, uh, we really basically, we really uh, encouraged and we really appreciated those people. These, uh, most of them are machine operators. Plus, also, uh -huh. we believe, you know, like we can't let only these people to come to work. Uh, yes, uh, Felix, actually, a question arising from that I would like to ask you. You said now some of the policy makers were making some um, decisions which were not correct at that time. So you had to step forward and to take the correct decision for the business. And I think that is very admirable because that rather than blaming it on the policymakers and the government that the business is taking the steps that they have to take. Uh, please tell us very briefly one instance where you took such a decision, where the, the policy was not very supportive, but you took a strong stand and took a decision, an example of that. Please tell us where it was beneficial later on, very shortly. Yes, for sure. I think I will go with the, the most common one was that, you know, they didn't have uh, what you call specially, there was a lot of pressure from the health sector, especially the uh, PHI, MOH levels to uh, close the economy forever. And they didn't want to uh, allow the factories to restart. And maybe when it ended restarting only with limited numbers, say 10%, 25%, whatever. But we were able to convince them, uh, not at once, it took a lot of efforts. We had to sweat a lot. To meet a lot of uh, uh, politicians, a lot of uh, policymakers. Slowly, I think we were able to get uh, everyone understand that you know we should right. run the factory because uh, unlike the other places, you know, we, we government fa government fa apparel factories, it's a lot of labor. Uh, people are working. Minimum, you get thousand, two thousand in, in each of our locations. We have more than two thousand people working. So this is one uh, and. And there were a lot of things, you know, that we had to really struggle with the, the uh, health the professionals or the even the public health inspectors or whatever. But then what we did was we never gave up. We, right. more or less, you know, rather than we were engaging in a, a constructive way to explain them what could be the repercussions. And okay. also there, uh, plus, uh, one, one yeah, example. Felix will come to, uh, yeah, we'll come to that with the next round. Because yeah. now that you have come to a point that when the policymakers were uh, even wanting to close down factories, but still convincing them to go on. So that, that that's, that's I think, a very good initiation that has been taken by you. On the same line, I would like to ask Sarah. Uh, Sarah, what in, in that line, what has been your experience working with women? And uh, how did you overcome that challenge when the policymakers were having one stand? Or, or, or when you faced with the pandemic at the beginning, uh, Sarah, please let us know in, about women in work at the IFC. How, how did you face it? Thanks, Amita. Um, I mean, look, we didn't have much interface with policies or policymakers. Um, and so I don't, I, I won't necessarily comment on, on that side of things, but I mean, I, I one of the, it was really interesting actually listening to Shahara talk about the approach that she took, um, you know, in the face of the pandemic initially, because so many of the the things that Shahara spoke about doing 
are exactly the kinds of leadership qualities that we see women exhibiting during this crisis and that are just that are a bit different to the kind of leadership qualities that men normally exhibit so it's been very interesting um, that what we've seen you know throughout the pandemic are that some of the leadership qualities that have been the most critical are those that aren't traditionally thought of as key corporate leadership qualities. So things like uh, empathy, things like creating personal relationships with your team members and your staff, putting staff first. I mean, I, Shahara, a number of the, the things that, that you said were really about putting employees first, putting their well-being first, thinking about them, how are we going to support our employees? Because without them, you don't have a business. Um, and so it's really interesting. I mean, we've seen some, some global studies coming out, for example, from the Harvard Business Review, who analyzed um, employee perceptions of 800 different corporate leaders um, across, across the world. And they found that during the pandemic, the uh, perception of women as leaders increased significantly in the corporate space because of the these importance of some of these leadership qualities that are more traditionally associated with women. Um, and I think in that context, what we're seeing throughout the pandemic is that those, those businesses that have more diverse leadership teams, both in terms of their management, but also in terms of their board representation, are able to actually manage the pandemic better. They're able to be more, um, more responsive. They're, they're often able to pivot more quickly because you see that they've got a more diverse um, group of, of individuals who are, who are coming to the table and brainstorming and, and you know, addressing challenges and, and coming up with solutions. Um, so I think that those are some of the things that, that, that I've been seeing in my work directly with companies here, but also that we're seeing across, across the globe and across all of the, the markets in which we're working with the private sector. Right, thank you so much, Sarah. We have uh, Honorable Iran Vikramaratna, Member of Parliament with us here. Um, Mr. Vikramaratna, you are a very successful businessman turned politician. So please uh, enlighten us. How do you think that the political leadership should change during this pandemic uh, for the success of the businesses and the corporate world, please? You're on mute, Mr. Vikramaratna. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, <clears throat> I would say that the pandemic has made everybody think that life is temporary. And therefore, one of the <clears throat> lessons come out, coming out of that is just clean up everything. That's one of the lessons that come. Whether it's uh, at home, the cleaning up needs to go on. Whether it's in the office, the cleaning up needs to go on. And that goes with then cost cutting, right? Kind of measures, right? And you, know, you, you rethink a lot of things and you think of lots of things that are basically unnecessary. Then the other thing is, this is going to be with us. There is a new normal. So uh, one of the positives of the new normal is working from home. Uh, I see it as a positive because the women's workforce in this country is 35, 36% of the workforce. I think this is an opportunity because one reason that women have kept off the workforce, one reason is apart from the cost, right? Uh, and the other reason is no flexibility, right? And there's less flexibility for women. And uh, now this concept of working from home is becoming the new norm. So I'm hoping against hope that we will find ways and means of actually getting more women into the workforce and the women's workforce going up, particularly uh, at the uh, um, management levels, right? Uh, that that opportunity is there. Uh, another thing that I think that it comes out of this is we need to deal with government through the uh, electronic media. The e-government needs to grow. Yeah, this is very important. You know, you, you, you know, earlier you have to go up in government office. You have to queue up from the drama center to the PHI to the municipality to the <laughs> utilities companies to the approvals, the licenses, and you know the whole lot, right? Because uh, I, I used to be in the private sector before I took a seat in parliament, right? And, and, and government, right, needs to really look at going more E and actually providing all the services in that particular way. Uh, so this is a lesson coming out of it. Obviously, turning the lesson into uh, uh, actual practice is going to take something. 
I might just close on this one idea. I was very interested in hearing some of the things I heard. Uh, in a crisis, some do better than others. And if I were to generalize, uh, particularly in terms of the companies, right, the space, uh, the bigger ones generally are able to survive and not just survive, some of them have actually done extremely well because they have understood they have understood the ground situation. They've understood uh, uh, the constraints. They've seen the opportunities and they have moved in that direction, right? Now the smaller ones, and I'm not just talking of employees, self-employed people. I'm glad for the people who are working in the companies and the factories, right? Uh, because they have uh, uh, some kind of uh, shield in the management and so forth. But lots of people in this country work for daily wages, you know, temporary employment, that's one group. But I'm thinking more about the company, the small uh, single owner company, the SME, right? Uh, we don't have data and statistics, but my generalization is that they are probably largely being struggling, right? Struggling. And uh, uh, no easy answer. Government needs to look at it. And also, I think businesses need to look at it in a new way. Maybe there may be partnerships that may be possible. Uh -huh. So uh, how do you think these partnerships should come about? Uh, as I say that. Sometimes what we have seen during the pandemic. Yes, please. Yeah, I hope I heard you clearly. Uh, I have no, I have no one clear answer for that, right? I don't have, uh, uh, but I, I would say in a, in a crisis, always the stronger party only can solve it and not the weaker party. I'll give you an example. The national question in this country can only be resolved by the majority in this country and not by the minority. Always the stronger party has to take the lead in resolving an issue. Similarly, in, in the business front as well, as I said, there is no one answer. I, I like to park this with the larger uh, firms, companies, and so forth, that uh, uh, the stronger party will find ways and means of actually uh, finding the, the smaller uh, groups and finding how they can relate. So I won't get into details with it through supply chains right. or you know, whatever, but those are the details. Thank you, Honorable Mr. Vikram Ratna. We would now, uh, Gani, on those lines, what is your take? You being a leader of the insurance sector and the insurance sector going through a lot of challenges during this time. Yeah? And why do you head Alliance Insurance and why, with your vast experience in the insurance field, can you please enlighten us? How did your field of insurance, how did your industry Come, come through this. What are your success stories? What are the solutions that you adopted, Gary? Well, let's firstly acknowledge uh, that it is an absolutely crazy time. <laughs> I don't think anybody was ready for this. I think when we, when this thing started, I remember still planning a holiday to go visit my parents at the end of next year. Uh, nobody knew that it was going to last so long. Uh, but coming back to uh, insurance specifically, uh, <clears throat> I think the uncertainty that everybody faced and what people need to do in terms of giving clear directions at what Shihara covered, right? It's talking about business objectives being stripped down to the basic level so that everyone in the company understands what you're doing and talk about the core, which is, for us, it was about making sure that our, that our customers and our partners, regardless of the challenges, were going to receive unimpeded service, right? That was going to continue. Our staff, regardless of our business objectives of profitability and growth and whatever else, our staff at no, at no way was going to be uh, uh, subject to uh, um, uh, a decision where it was going to impact them from a safety and health perspective, right? We were going to find ways to give back to the community. So I think we just talking about those two, three, four things in the most basic way ensures that you have a team that's going to follow you, 
in the new direction. But there was just so many things uh, we had to learn. Uh, the insurance sector is fortunate, like some of the others here, where it is, uh, a, a, you know, an essential service. People still need to buy insurance. They still need to renew their insurance and so on. But the general insurance sector is impacted. How we are directly linked to the uh, correlation between economic uh, success, uh, growth and uh, general insurance growth. If there's no cars, we know import, there's no imports, no new, new cars, your motor insurance is going to be impacted. Exports go down, your marine insurance is going to be. People don't travel, there's no travel insurance. So all that's going to go down. But uh, um, as Mr. Eran, uh, Honorary Mr. Eran said earlier, right? Uh, how does how do you look at the opportunities instead of the challenges? For us in insurance, we knew that life and medical insurance would shoot through the roof, right? In terms of awareness. So we may have had holes that we needed to cover in the general insurance side, but we have to be limber enough to pivot and change direction. And for us, we have a lot of our sales are actually uh, driven by independent contractors and agents. How do we motivate them when their business is down? In a lockdown environment, we improved themselves. We did a lot of online training and development. We also made sure that they were doing time management. In other words, their customers are actually also in lockdown. It's a great opportunity for them to connect. It's a great opportunity for them to build that relationship for future business. The business may not be there today, but it will be there tomorrow. Right, right. Thank you, Gary. Yes. So while we go through our panel discussion, let's take some of the questions that are posed also by the audience. There's one question. This is for the entire panel, but I would like some other panelists to a volunteer to answer for this. This is from organizations that are suffering due to the pandemic. The question is from Charita Bay Wagner. How can confidence be restored to team members when working capital is dwindling and revenues are also being away? I repeat the question, team members, when working capital is dwindling and revenues also are slipping away. Yes, please. Who in the panel would like to uh, answer this? Mr. Vikramanasa, what about you? I think it's better for one because Panad was in the business to answer. Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. um, I can just... Um, from my experience, yeah, like I said, we had a we had some because we're diversified in so many different areas. With some companies that really went through uh, this challenge, and I think number one thing is yes, you have to cut costs. And when you do cut those costs, there's a way to do it. You don't say no bonus this year. You would say we are deferring the bonus to next year when things get better, so that they have a hope. So like. Uh, they have a hope that if things recover, yes, we will still pay. It's not like we're going to take it away uh, forever. Or it's like, um, let's put it in a kitty and then see, let's share it uh, equally. Or let's see who are the worst affected and, have, and buffer them at the bottom. And then the seniors take a higher pay cut if, if necessary. So make it fair. So when the, when the management is fair, the people feel like, yes, they're not doing this using the pandemic as an excuse. It's really because the company can't pay its dues. It's really because there is no working capital. And you have to communicate. Um, normally, we'd have a once in a month uh, management meeting. But when the pandemic hit, we had weekly, weekly teams meetings. And, you know, constantly tomorrow lockdown that was changing, next week open, then the rules change. So we had to be much more agile. And that, co that constant communication, even if it was an email, we say email, this is our policy for this week, for this month, not even a month, we couldn't even plan for a month. This week, this is our policy. We are paying for the transport of those who are coming by public transport, for example. You know, or uh, people, non-essential back office workers work from home and we will hire laptops and give you. So that kind of communication 
with Essential. And them hearing from us, which they normally sometimes don't see us, we are shareholders at our level. We don't even, you know, address some of the staff sometimes. And I think that motivation also went a long way. And third, thirdly, I would say celebrate the small successes. For example, if we were able to still still uh, handle, you know, three vessels in, in that week, then give the team a pat on the back. You know, they risk their lives. A lot of my shipping guys actually risk so much by coming into office because they still had to be on the scene. They, have, they had to interact with customers. They had to go to the port. They had to handle vessels. So, you know, we really applauded them because they took the company forward, not like, you know, uh, the back office who, who, yes, supported by working from home, but, um, you know, so celebrate the small successes. So, and, and, and really, and hope that, you know, wait for the times to get better because the pandemic is not forever, right? It's the main thing is to ride that wave while the revenues are down. And, 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 and finally, of course, think out of the box and think out of new business lines. Like for example, my leisure sector, my hotel had to completely shut down. Uh, and then finally, we slowly got into this tier one business and the quarantine. It's not the same as before, but you know, you work around it, think out of the box, think of new revenue streams right. and, and change um, with the situation. That's, that's right. what I can say. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Shahara. We'll take one more question. It's from Kay Pereira asking, do we talk much about working from home and having online meetings and regular meetings, etc. Is the infrastructure of our corporate culture suitable for working from home or studying from home? But our focus is on businesses and, the, and leadership. So let's talk about, do you think the infrastructure is, well, not, not maybe not for the big businesses per se, but maybe the businesses that are coming up or mid-level companies, et cetera, SMEs, what do you think? Yes, it is not. So it's an issue. But what are the tips that you can give? Issue is there. We don't have to talk about the issue. What are the tips or any inspirational ideas that you can give uh, for the, with the infrastructure challenge to work from home? Uh, maybe I'll go, Amida. Just, uh, I think firstly, we've got to acknowledge that uh, this is going to be core and critical for people to work, people to do business, people to interact, which means uh, as an individual, you have to start investing in it. You have to invest in technology. You have to, you need to get a better plan from a dialogue. And if dialogue doesn't work for your area, get an SLP. You probably need to get a better router in your house. You need an expander. You need a booster, Right. Uh, people those days would have said, I need to advise, you know, invest in a nice shirt. I need to invest in a nice car. I need to uh, pull out my house. But I think this has got to be the number one investment. And I'm talking from a micro perspective about individuals and organizations need to do the same. I think if you are a large organization, you are a multinational like us, you are quite for fortunate. We do have some reserves set aside perfectly for a rainy day like this. Uh, but um, I think in a small organization, it is very important to firstly say that this is now going to become a major investment that you have to make. Uh, and maybe as some of the others shared, we can cut, cut the expenses, cut the corners on the other areas, but not for this. Right. That's very helpful, Gani. Thank you. Anyone would like to add to that, please? Yeah, Meta, maybe I could um, also just please. expand a little bit on that. And, and I think one of the things we have been seeing is a lot of employers are, are supporting employees with things like infrastructure, you know, new routers, paying for internet connections, you know, all of these things, cell phones, et cetera, um, which goes a long way. But I think the, the fundamental challenge is that most businesses prior to the COVID pandemic really didn't have flexibility policies or practices at all. Right, so for everyone, mostly at the start of this pandemic, this was an entirely new approach and everybody had to kind of shuffle around and try to figure out how to deal with that. And we're now at the point that, you know, people have kind of figured it out a bit. Most, most places have got it worked out. But at some point, we're going to transition back. And, and then there's going to be this interesting, um, you know, situation where some people will, will need to have more flexibility and will want to have more flexibility, whether that's working from home, whether that's working adjusted hours so that they can deal with childcare or elder care or, you know, there's their small business that they have to run on the side because their income's gone down. Um, and so I think it's really useful to think about not just 
working from home, but this concept of working flexibly. And how can businesses actually put in place structures where every staff member, regardless of your role or function, has the opportunity to have that flexibility. So even if you're a frontline staff member who needs to be, you know, at your machine or, or on the factory floor or, you know, um, unloading crates at the port, uh, there still are ways that businesses can build the flexibility, whether it's, job, you know, job sharing, uh, whether it's uh, being able to start later so you can drop your kids at school. Uh, and so I think just it's, it's really useful to think about this kind of holistic idea of flexibility within which supporting employees to be able to work from home is one very critical piece to give people that flexibility. Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. Anyone else wants to add to that? I would uh, want to just, uh, I agree with everything that was said and the point which is Subramania made is that we are thinking new. You know, it's not a, from a motorcycle to a car and from a car to a better car and a bigger car. We have to actually start everybody investing in information technology. That was one. And this is a, also a psychological changes. Uh, when you wake up in the morning and you're working from home, please dress up. Have a separate place that you have designated for work. Because even they're working from home, it's locational. Uh, and uh, everybody has their challenges at home, right? And uh, having a separate place is, I think, another very important practical thing. Now, it's, we say that to our children when they are going to do their homework and studying. Now, we have to say it to ourselves as well, adults, that you actually need to have a devoted space in which you can work uninterrupted. I would make a quick comment on uh, transferring this the working environment onto education. And that here, we all have a big challenge because from the instrument itself, the vast majority in this country don't have an instrument. And if they have one instrument at home, an iPad, a computer, a smartphone, whatever, and they have three children, my heavens, they really got a huge problem because which child gets it for which class or which interaction. So we have a huge problem. Then we have a, a issue about connectivity as well and it has improved tremendously. Uh, I think some of these things are never going to normalize completely. And therefore, these are the challenges that any government will face in the future. Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. May that let me add something? Yes, let me add one to that because I think we are, as a company, I mean, we use least the work from home mindset because I think bulk of our employees are, you know, has to be needed in the production floor. But then also the, the support staff, yeah, for the last year, about two to three months, we had to take care of, uh, fortunately, we had a good uh, uh, infrastructure, but then again, maybe we'll have to uh, uh, face some issues like, uh, you know, quickly buy certain laptops, you know, it was not enough, you know, to give to the, all the members to work from home for that uh, quarter period. So there were a few things, but then after that uh, first three months, let's say from last year, May, June, even though there's a possibility for the for these people to work from home as a practice, as a as a uh, motivational aspect for the other employees, uh, we decided as much as possible everybody uh, come to work come uh, because that's the best way to because you are asking uh, these uh, poor people who are the uh, blue collar workers, the machine operators who come work, you know, take a lot of traveling or whatever. And uh, then when they don't see that their bosses or their other people are not there physically, uh, that was the big, uh, big issue. Because we had a lot of problems coming from the, uh, due to the uh, lack of knowledge. And also uh, um, the grievances were like maybe uh, fueled by the certain act of certain, uh, uh, let's say, PHIs or whoever. Uh, again, I would say, I wouldn't blame them if the lack of knowledge. And especially the stigma also associated with the apparel girl, garment girl or whatever. So all these things, you know, we from the from the CEO down to uh, everyone, we as much as possible. Unless otherwise you don't have uh, some, you don't have uh, some uh, big people at home, or like maybe you have some old parents at home. Except for that, we encourage everyone to come to the factory and work from there because then only we could say, yes, look, you know, no one is uh, uh, what do you call discriminated. So we had to make sure that we make that call because there, there were some people, you know, even from the health authorities, they were asking, why are you asking these people to come? But then we had to tell that 
yeah if we are hiding them at home then it's not correct for these people to come to work it was very right. it was very difficult for these people to come to work get get back to the work yeah yes that's right thank you very much felix also we have a very uh, much in line to that connected to that we have a question from our facebook because of our panel discussion is lively streamed in the women in management page in facebook too and the question from there is please share your tips like with an example not issues because in this discussion we are not talking about issue but we are talking about how we have overcome an issue so that it will be inspirational to the audience please uh, share with us how you have overcome the issue of mental health positively when working from home because a lot of employees especially maybe not the senior management the senior management also but mid level lower level management and non managerial employees are, are really tired some say that they are even more tired on endless zoom meetings from home rather than uh, going to office going to office they used to enjoy they didn't enjoy at that time but now it seems it, it was a better thing rather than just sitting in front of the computer and also sometimes been a bit bit harassed by the office because they are expected to be there all the time 24/7 because you don't commute that you save on the commuting time transport and traffic time so that you have to be behind the computer a lot of people are getting orthopedic surgeon say patients come to them with neck pain spinal pain hip uh, pain and uh, these are going to have long term repercussions so as leaders who are running successful businesses also into a very um, what do you call a different perspective of politics etc what is your tip what is your way forward to look at the mental health positively when working from home during this pandemic um mena i i i think this is a this yes, is a please. fantastic question and and really thank you so much um to the individual who asked this this is something which has been so critical um during the pandemic and we actually at isc we did a, a study last year of uh of 16 businesses large businesses to take a bit of a pulse of how staff and and businesses were were kind of addressing dealing with the pandemic and we found a huge number of staff saying that their mental health and wellness was was really affected and actually we found more men than women were more likely to report this as being the case due to you know increased stresses at work uh the increased stresses of of trying to manage working from home you know potential job losses having kids around you know all of the 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 kind of the the changes and the uncertainty that came with the pandemic um and we also found that over a third of the employees that we surveyed and were actually asking their employers for mental health support whether that be in the form of of psychological counseling access to things like meditation um and and you know we've seen a really really big uptick in the number of companies that are actually offering these kind of services to their employees in the same way that that they might offer medical insurance or other you know medical support physical medical support and it's really really critical to ensuring the the full the full health and safety of the workforce um and so we've heard great stories of of companies who've been running weekly wellness sessions where where employees can log on and and have a you know either a short meditation session or there might be a a panel discussion with, a, with an expert to talk about how do you deal with the stresses of of working working from home with children or how do you deal with uncertainty um and you know we've seen employees responding extremely well to having these kind of support services available um the other thing we've seen some companies doing is actually having access to to counselors who can provide that more one-on-one -on -one counseling to people who need it um which which has also been really really critical um and then in in some cases we've had uh you know larger businesses like MAS and and Brandex who actually have on-site counselors who can be there to support their staff members um but i do think this is something that it, that has been incredibly important throughout the pandemic and it's only more so as it continues for longer uh and so i think every every business leader should have this as one of their priorities is supporting the mental health of of their workforce thanks yeah maybe if i can Thank add you very I... much, yes gary please 
Uh, yeah, I think uh, Sarah said it. We have to show tangible support. I think we've we've done wellness uh, sessions, Zumba, yoga, uh, you know, martial arts, uh, learn how to cook. Uh, I think with the regional office, uh, a lot of the CEOs actually cooked a dish. So we, we made sure that was there. And even when you talk about uh, mental health, uh, we have a mental health helpline for staff. We've invested in it. Uh, and uh, all that, we have to show tangible support. But I think we are all learning as we go through this. And one of the things is really the flexibility around working hours. As leaders, we have to walk the talk. If we used to have, because our communications have to, uh, the frequency of communications have to increase. As I think Shehara mentioned, we used to do one month, monthly meetings. All of us now do weekly meetings. Sometimes it's twice a week meetings. We have to be in terms of what time does the meeting start, right? We need to know if, uh, if, um, if, if it's a working mom and they are making sure their son or daughter is logging on to class in the morning. Let's not set a meeting that clashes with that, right? So we have to be flexible and kind of cognizant of the fact that these, the surroundings have changed and people are basically double hatting. So if we don't, if we don't do something about it, if we don't cater for it and show tangible support, uh, then uh, we'll fail. Yeah, I'd just like to add, um, Medha, if uh, personally, I even I found from a, from, I won't talk from a company's viewpoint, but I talk from a personal viewpoint. Um, uh, it was a challenge to motivate myself. And I think working from home, we really all need to um, motivate ourselves to keep our energy high because my industry, shipping and logistics, was a very uh, social industry. We had constant meetings with port, with, uh, with the customs. We had constant cocktails, cost, constant entertainment, dinner, because it's a very interactive. So all of this stuff. So it's a matter of then I, I realized exercise, spirituality, uh, being calm, and also um, engaging um, with uh, your friends and family as well in whatever way you can online through maybe, you know, on Zoom meetings for friends even, that helps to relax your mind as well. So I think all of this, we have to just work around the, around the box and really keep ourselves uh, motivated because it can be very draining to only deal on Zoom uh, with, the, with people. And um, of course, I think it saves a lot of time because the commute is saved and a lot of money saved, especially for my overseas travel, because I had to travel to so many countries for meetings with the shipping lines previously, or they had to come down. So a lot of time is saved, but at the same time, uh, it's not as much fun. So you have to um, really motivate oneself. And I think uh, health and health in body and mind is, is key for that. And yeah. Meta, can I just add one last, um, one last comment here that I think one of the things that's also we sometimes forget about is just that personal interaction with, with staff. And, and, you know, in Australia, they have we this have Are You question. Okay campaign. And just, having, just asking staff, are you okay? Asking your colleagues, are you okay? How are you coping? That can go a really long way to, um, you know, to, to supporting people and, and letting them know that they're supported. Uh, Meta, may I... Uh... May I all for the question yeah. Yeah. slightly because uh, mm -hmm. I would say it's a great industry. Yeah, it's true. It's work from home is a tough challenge. But at the same time, in a pandemic like this, you know, to leave home where when everyone else is at home, uh, your parents, your husbands, your brothers, sisters, everyone at home, only you have to come to work. And that's also a huge mental stress. Don't you think so? Yeah. Yes, it is. So, so, and how did you how did you encourage your employees to overcome that stress? Yeah, that that was a tough of a challenge. You know, it's really a big challenge. The reason is uh, these people because they have they know the company culture, company values, and they know that the company stands for them. So they most of these people they didn't have any issues in coming, but the problem was from the neighbors. 
the mother, father, auntie, uncle, whoever, uh, fiance, the husband, all sort of things. So it was not, it's a tough issue. Plus, you know, from the village, the village, maybe it could be even the Gramanila Dari, or it could be even sometimes, you know, we had to face the situation. In fact, I had to go and uh, share with the, the top of the church authority also, uh, the Archbishop of Colombo, that some priests also have announced, you know, don't go to work in this factory. They are, they are, they are, they are making the sermon, you know. So it was uh, unbelievable some months. So what we did was we basically, we said, you know, we have to it basically serve a lack of communication. So what we have done was just to tell you like until today, we have 13,500, 14,000 workers. Until today, we have done 15,500 PCR tests. So, okay, so the number of employees 13,500, we have done so far 15,500 PCR tests. So what we are doing, we have basically shared and also we have help the villagers also. When they have seen some positive cases, they don't have enough transport to uh, take them to the uh, quarantine center. So we, that's where we have come in. And also we form teams, not only from the management, even from the lower level, so that everyone is aware that company is doing their best. Uh, profit is not the motive here. It's the motive is, you know, the, the, the employees, they are family members and also our surrounding people. People in the yeah. because villages, they are, uh, it's very tough, you know, when it goes to the rural area, they think, you know, yeah. these factories are not producing garments, they're producing uh, uh, virus, you know. The situation was like that. So we had to actually, we had to send some teams differently uh, with the, uh, what do you call, with the curfew, with the situation, got with the special passes, maybe arrange few uh, group meetings. We'll tell the Buddhist monk or the, uh, church uh, priest, you know, maybe your grandmother there to bring some uh, leaders in the village to one location, and we, our people will go and tell what will be, what will they will be losing, what are they going to be losing if we keep these factories closed? What, yeah. what will be the repercussions for the country? Sorry. So that education yeah. had yeah. to be done, and yes. so that was yes. a huge battle. Um, battle. So that battle. also, battle. yeah, and also battle. for the most of these people come from the transport, so the transporters are worried. For it so that we didn't uh, separate them, we considered even our uh, whatever the way supply chain partners are also part of our family. So that you know, even if we do a BCR test, we include uh, whether it's the canteen people or the security, or uh, so that you know, that everything once you come inside, so we we, we uh, made a, a sort of a, a, we chain we brainwashed the people, it's not really brainwashed, it's not lying or whatever, that they felt it's better to come to office or factory, they are more safer here than they stay at home. So that was right. the, right. yeah, okay. how we were okay. able to uh, Thank get you. it done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felix. Uh, very good insights from the entire panel. There is a question from Mayanti Fernando to Honorable Iran Vikramaratna. Do the do politicians understand what is actually going on in the country? Or are they just arguing for the sake of their survival? Um, Honorable. I don't uh, I don't know whether there is a clear answer. Uh, there is a yes and a no to that. Uh, you know, do the politicians really understand? Uh, are they arguing for their survival? Oh, just take that as a given. They say uh, that, uh, you know, uh, you are fighting for your survival, right, in your businesses, and politicians are fighting for their survival. That's a given. Uh, but uh, do they really understand? And uh, I would say yes and no. And uh, very quickly to say, you know, if you look at uh, recent, the whole discussion about fertilizer and organic fertilizer, very good goal. But anybody knows that, you know, how practical is it? What time frame should you implement it and so forth? Because, uh, you know, those of you who are in the private sector in business, you know, you are making those decisions all the time. And sometimes we don't have the experience. So sometimes good goals, right? But uh, very difficult in terms of translating that into good decisions. Uh, if you take the vaccines, for example, uh, you know, vaccines all over the world are the domain of governments. Governments only through their health ministries vaccinate people. It's not given to the private sector. But just hypothetically think that it was in the private sector. I will assure you that the whole of Sri Lanka would have been vaccinated by now. You know why? You would have moved so quickly because you know the demand is there. You know that the supply will 
be in short. And so therefore you would have made a decision and it's a more quick business decision. But uh, governments don't work, work like that. So you see the results that we have. If you uh, uh, look at you know, the, the fiscal management, you are, you are cutting costs, yeah? you're making rational investments now, right? And, and, and trying to be profitable, right? Governments, we are always getting into a bigger problem, right? Because fiscal management is, simply putting it, is just cutting costs and increasing revenue and reducing the deficit. So I think some don't really understand, I, I, I will admit, don't, and that there are people who understand. Now, one telling comment today, which I will uh, just say that and conclude. Alliance, I remember you made a comment saying that you will give Sri Lankan airlines to, the, to a private investor for $1. He came and actually told that to me today, right? And uh, then he continues and tells me, but it's negative network. Then I said, I'm a politician, so I can't be saying that. So I said, I'll give it for one dollar. Right? So clearly, politicians do understand. They may not understand everything, but they do understand, right? But when we take decisions, right, we may not always be taking the rational decision. And the decision may be weighted in terms of, as I said, our survival. Right. Uh, thank you. There is another question from Facebook live stream of the women in management page. The question is, working from home is more to managers and executives. I'm just repeat, I'm, I'm narrating the question as it was posted. Many workers have lost their jobs due to the pandemic and they cannot work from home due to poverty and other infrastructure deficiencies. How can we think out of the box to innovate new jobs for these people who cannot work online? Shall I repeat? Working from home is more for managers and executives. Many workers have lost their jobs due to the pandemic and they cannot work from home due to poverty and for infrastructure deficiencies. How, do we, how can we think out of the box to innovate jobs for people who cannot work online? Honorable Vikramalatha, maybe that's a question for you again. <laughs> no, no. I, I was actually, I was also having questions like I was going to ask Mr. Felix Fernando. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, it's a very, very it good question be because I said it's yeah. absolutely right. Managers, senior managers and all, it's a bit clearer. Working from home for us is clearer. And when you're talking about, yeah. you know, the, 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 the lady who comes to the garments factory, Right, and there is a certain given way they operate. I was really wondering whether you know this will evolve to the place where actually you could have a whole lot of suppliers, right? Small, 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 small suppliers all over the way, i.e., working from home. Right? Whether this is even a dream, you see. Uh, of course, your issues are going to be timeliness, quality management, you know, and lots of logistical issues and all that. Uh, but yeah, this yeah. is the thing that came to my mind. I don't have solutions, obviously. Uh, okay. To, yeah, maybe to, uh, maybe from your, yes, uh, Honorable Vikramatta, maybe from your former company, you can, you can, you might have insight as to how they're handling the situation now, this particular situation. No, no. I, I, would I, Felix don't, like, I don't have like to uh, enlighten yeah. on that. No, too, you I don't wear that hat anymore. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yes, Felix. Yeah, yeah to Mr. Vikramaratna's uh, remarks, I would say, yeah, I think at this moment it looks like a dream. There are certain things that people are developing, you know, like maybe you can buy your own, maybe smaller, but something basically, basic thing need to be, okay, you go to a shop, you have, you have a small machine, you can uh, personalize it. But uh, the reason is also it's not possible for one country uh, to uh, do this thing because there are buyers. Yeah, Felix, in uh, to interrupt you there. Yes. Felix, uh, if you pardon me to interrupt you there, it's not about sure. the devices. Like we discussed about, say, the cleaning staff. 
the housekeeping staff, the tea makers, then some of the laborers who come to these big factories and big corporates, um, who, who uh, the work is not available to do online. You can't clean online or you can't you know, carry goods uh, online, some of the container, uh, who you'll be helping out at the container, uh, containers or at the yards. So uh, not the device, not, not the knowledge, but it's not possible to do that during a lockdown. Uh, for, for that stuff, uh, Shihara, like now with, with the shipping industry, because it's a supply chain industry where you have a lot of those uh, non-technically versatile people employed. How did you face that challenge? And then we come to Felix also. Shahara, would you like to uh, share your experience on that? Yeah, I think a uh, number, like for people who really can't work from home because the work is not available, you have to uh, look at two options. One is to retrain. Uh, for example, some of them, like people in, in the hotel, uh, the maintenance guys were doing security because security was outsourced and we didn't need. So like you have to get them to do a job rotation and do something else instead of what they were doing previously. Um, or you have to basically, uh, you know, uh, enable this work to be done uh, from home, if you can, for example, like for, for us before, uh, printing a BL from home was not something which was possible. Those guys had to come to office and, you know, go to the counter and hand it over to the, uh, to the importer or the exporter. But I mean, we, we, like I said, we, you have to innovate. So you innovated so that this document could be done online. So for example, right. you know, think of a way to change your process or your, or the way you're doing your business so that it can be done from home. So, I mean, right. less than. Right. Yeah. Do any of our panelists have an example of uh, how it was really done, like a real experience? For example, that say the, I, I'm really naming some of the industries, some of the workers here, the security guy. The security officer can't uh, do security functions from home. Yeah. So, and <laughs> that, and the tea maker. Uh, what about the cleaner, the cleaning lady? And also most of these people had been outsourced, as Shihara correctly said, to other companies. So we, we, our connection was not to that particular a, a worker, but to that outsourced company. And um, some of the laborers and some of the, uh, some of the, say, some of the boutiques that had come up, uh, providing perhaps lunch and tea to these businesses, there are always uh, payment vendors, food sellers, you know, people like that who have completely, absolutely, though they, even if they have devices, those businesses cannot be carried on by devices. Uh, particularly, particularly in your company, some of your staff could not work online. It's, there's no, no way that they can do it. Have you, um, you might have examples, you might not, that's okay. But have you had any instances how those people were either retrained or in some other way put into work? that work or some other work or uh, is there anything like that you can share if not we can move to the next topic if you don't have not a problem no, i think so, Neda, yeah I uh, think yes, in our, yeah in our case i would say that because since this is being considered as essential service uh, i think there was no requirement for that even for the outsourcing people that they were able to offer their services but i i agree with you I'm not sure I don't have an answer for that. Like maybe for the people who were not considered, like maybe the payment, you know, who were selling uh, lunch packets or tea or whatever, and maybe from uh, maybe office tea makers or cleaning staff. I'm not sure how, how to uh, go ahead with that. But in our cases, but I, I, I would simply say, I think it, rather than finding the uh, attack in the micro issues, uh, I would say like if all, de uh, depending on how uh, a government and its people should act in a pandemic pandemic like this. I don't think that, we, I think at both levels, I think we showed very, very poor discipline, both the levels at the uh, government level as, as well as the people, public level. We didn't show that uh, discipline to uh, uh, work in a pandemic like this. So we were really, I mean, we sometimes we behaved as that there is nothing wrong, you know, there's, I think we need to um, understand now this new normal, how long we have to uh, stay with this one. Also, let's say the country will be 100% vaccinated. We don't know if there will be some other variants coming in 
and those variants, uh, these uh, whatever the vaccines that we are given, they are capable of uh, uh, fighting with those uh, variants. We are not sure. So we really do not know how long you have to stay with this new normal situation. Does that mean that these people, whether the people who are selling tea at the payment or sending lunch packets or office tea boys, they have to be jobless. And also some of them, they are old. I think there are some of them, especially the feeding staff or security staff or whatever, probably over 50, would be over 50. So is it correct? I mean, will they invest in retraining on something else? What will be the uh, job uh, opportunities? So we need to consider this. I would say the easiest option is, you know, from top to bottom or bottom to top. I think we need to have self-discipline. Both the levels, I would say, I reiterate, you know, we can't blame only the government, but even public, we have to make sure that, you know, we, we uh, we take, uh, we have self-discipline, we grow up. I think we are really lacking that one because uh, it's not. Uh, I don't think the situation has gone uh, like uh, like this bad as well as uh, I think our Honorable Minister said. Uh, oh. Even the vaccination, you yeah. know, we would have done, you would have finished by now. Uh, really speaking, this is something, uh, but unfortunately, you know, the decision sure. makers, all the, although they are intelligent, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Felix. Thank you for that insight. Yes. We have uh, another question from the audience that is uh, on a, it's a gender based um, question. So maybe that uh, Sarah, as your uh, the program manager at Women in Work, maybe you can answer that answer to, together with Shihara, how you would see that, and, and all the panelists can certainly chip in. This is that now the society has changed because of COVID-19, the society has changed how it looks like performing, how it looks at the performance of women, because now it is not about how she makes a decision, but about how she performs from home and achieves targets. Uh, it, it's a, if it's a little unclear because I do justice to the question posed by the member in the audience by asking in those words itself, but let me it has changed the manner of how the woman works because now it is not about uh, whether it's a man or woman working. how he or she is performing from home and that COVID-19 and online some of the stereotypes to take some tasks uh, uh, it's actually not about gender it's more about delivering results so what do you think Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. If there I was a yeah. Also. yeah, there was a bit of a disturbance. If I understood yeah. it, um, uh, you're saying before the uh -huh. pandemic, it was about, you know, if you're a man or a woman and all of that, but now it's just about your performance. Is that what the question is? That is asked to me. Yeah. Yes, precisely. That the worker, but about delivering targets and achieving the performance. But more to get that established, because even before women rights groups, etc., were fighting for that at that position, but it's the result. But has not COVID 19 proved it more? Shahara, you got the question right. Please uh, share your thoughts. Yeah, well, actually, I've, I, for me, it's always been about performance. It's never been about gender. I don't consider myself a woman leader. I consider myself a leader, always. So even before the pandemic, uh, it's never been about gender for me. It's just about making the right decisions, hiring the right people, uh, be it man or woman. So it's always been about performance and that's what I always tell my female work. even I support all my women's day activities all the welfare everything I support but in the end I tell everybody performance is key it's always about 
how competent you are, how good you get the job done. You're not going to get special treatment just because you're a woman. But yes, because they're a woman, we have to support in childcare, uh, maybe from uh, the, uh, the organization point, from uh, flexibility, those things, yes. But when it comes to job, the expectation is the same, be it a man or a woman. And yeah. I think this, is, this has always been the case. And I don't think the pandemic, for me personally, it didn't change that. Yeah, and I think most business leaders um, would balk at the suggestion that they previously made decisions based on whether you were a man sure, or a woman. Sure. Thank you. Thank <laughs> I think that yeah. that's probably um, not a position that anybody would, that? would like to, um, you know, to, to, to position themselves as. Sorry, Mida, I interrupted you. Okay. Um, but I think, I mean... Sure, sure. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. Thank you, thank you. Thank you both. Question. No. Sarah, we have a question. Can you tell us during the... I have to interrupt, you Medha. Your line is not clear, no. Medha. I have to interrupt you, Medha. Your, uh, your line is not clear. Uh, Sarah is giving the answer. Hold on for a minute. Sarah, please proceed. Uh, sure. Thank, thanks, Alotana. Um, I think one of the things that I wanted to reflect on in the context of, of kind of, I guess, performance and, and measuring performance and measuring delivery is, you know, it's not just about did X person deliver, you know, what they were they were asked of or, you know, or kind of measuring performance in, you know, in kind of an objective sense, but it's also about people being having access to the opportunities, the same opportunities. It's, I think, you know, as Shahara touched upon, it's recognizing that every individual, whether they're a woman or a man, is, is dealing with different issues that can impact their ability to deliver at work. And whether that's issues at home around childcare, whether it's things to do with the way they're treated by others in the workplace, you know, which could be bullying, it might be harassment, um, whether it's just around things like being given access to the right kind of training or being given access to the kind of career opportunities that they need to grow and, and, to, and to, you know, to get the experience they need to progress. Um, so indeed, I think most, you know, most successful businesses have structures in place to ensure that decisions are made based on a series of metrics, but it's about making sure that both women and men have access to the opportunities to be able to succeed in achieving those metrics. Um, and in some cases, it's also about revisiting and reflecting what those metrics are. So for example, we often know that, that some businesses, in order to progress through to particular seniority levels, you may have to go and manage a remote work site, for example. Now, for many women, that may be something that they just are not interested in doing because of family commitments or you know, caring for elders, et cetera. And so what businesses can do is actually look at that and say, what is it about that assignment that is so critical for our managers? and see if there is another way that those staff who can't do that particular assignment can get, ac can get access to those, um, you know, that experience and, and, and those things. So, so I think the, um, yeah, I think most businesses do their best <laughs> to make decisions based not on gender, um, but we all have our own biases um, and, you know, and that does influence the way we make decisions. So the more that businesses can put in place structures and processes to help you know, break down some of those biases and some of those structural in inequalities, the more likely they are to see a more equal distribution of women and men all the way through their, 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 pi their pipeline. I would like to add okay. something. Thank you so much, Sarah. Earlier I was speaking, I, uh, is, it, is it still not clear? Still not clear, is it? Better. Yeah. But, okay, okay. Uh, sorry, earlier I was speaking, uh, Sarah, I didn't uh, hear you speaking. Uh, sorry about it. Apologies. Yes. Now we have uh, just 10 more minutes to wind up the session. So I would like to ask a quiz, quick question from all of us. Uh, very briefly, just take one minute each and tell us that what, what are the, uh, during these past 18 months, during the pandemic, what, what is the main leadership trait that you had sharpened? I'm sure you had it already, but you had kind of had it at the back of the store, uh, but uh, which was most useful for you? Was it motivation? Was it patience? Was it letting go? What, what is it? What, what is the key leadership trait 
that you harnessed during the past 18 months so that the middle level management and, uh, and even the top management in the audience will be able to learn from you and be inspired from you. I would like everybody to take just one to two minutes to tell that trait because we need to go to the round and um, we uh, have to, we can take another question as well. Uh, sorry, I, 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 again, because of the interruption, um, Honorable Iran Vikramalatna, were you saying something? I'm sorry. Um, uh, yes, I was just going yeah. to quick, quickly add Please. to what Sarah said, that Please, in, businesses, in businesses, we don't discriminate among men and women, particularly in senior management. We think of it like Shehara said uh, about performance. Um, however, having said that, right, there are cultural prejudices and we need to be consciously or unconsciously. Uh, in my board, I mean, I had only one woman. In the senior management, I had only one woman. And uh, 10 years going on, I don't see very big changes that have happened. And when I tried to promote a 35-year-old into senior management, uh, some of the seniors talked to me privately and said, are you sure, you know, does she have the experience? Can she handle it, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, if I had done that to a 35-year-old male, he would have come and told me, good choice, he's on the fast track, okay? But for the woman, they were never using the word fast track. So there are, I think we need to be realistic. And, and uh, I'm just adding to what Sarah said, that we are performance-based, but uh, these issues are there. And the more we talk about it, the more we are conscious about it, is the way we will break it. Because if we don't talk about it, I think we will be doing an injustice. Yeah. Uh, we really appreciate it, Mr. Vikramaratna, that, uh, that honest, very honest uh, point, because rather than just saying that everybody is equal, now we have equal status, etc., uh, it's very important that someone like you come out with the real uh, experience scenario so that um, it's encouraging to everybody to first acknowledge that there is disparity and that there are cultural stereotypes so that we can then move past it and move beyond it. Thank you very much. Yes. So can we have that, um, the round of sharing insight as to the leadership trait that we develop? We have another five minutes more to wind up. So let's take a minute. Uh, can we again start with the ladies now that as we are on this <laughs> uh, uh, gender stereotype is the last point that we spoke about. Shihara, what has it been for you uh, as a leader, what is the leadership trait that you developed most in the COVID pandemic? I would say it's empowering my teams because we're a family owned business and we used to, a lot of the control is centered around the family members. But throughout the pandemic, I think we, even before the pandemic, we, were, we started a program where we brought in a lot of professional CEOs, managers and changed the structure a lot. And uh, during the pandemic, I had to learn to empower them to make decisions and let go a lot of my um, authority or the decisions that had to come to me. It was hard in the beginning, but then I realized by trusting uh, the right people and then having the mechanisms also of the right information to come to me, uh, I leave them to make key decisions because they had to be made daily. They had to be made on the ground in the spot. It, they couldn't be coming to me for everything. And um, it was very hard because everybody wouldn't do things the way I would do it. But I think even if you do it in a different way, the result, if the result is the same, then it's a matter of patience and really, you know, uh, trusting um, uh, in that judgment and, and really listening to others as well. So I would say it's um, uh, devolving that power in the right way and trusting my team to make the right decisions. Sure. So in one word, it's trust and also empowerment. empowerment. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Shahara. Sarah. Uh, we, we, I'm sorry, like I, I know you have a lot to share, everybody, but as we are in the last five minutes, I would have to limit all the panelists for one minute, please, to talk about the one leadership uh, trait. Right. I mean, there have, of course, been many, but I think one of the one that's been really particularly key during this period has been being kind of flexible and, and adaptable, uh, you know, and the ability to, to make you know, changes and decisions quickly, uh, you know, when, if you're planning on, on delivering something a particular way, and then all of a sudden, there's a curfew, or, you know, that client has now, uh, you know, is experienced, experiencing, you know, significant challenges because of a curfew or whatever. So the ability to actually adapt, 
um, be, re be responsive, um, you know, to take the situation as it comes and then, you know, respond and adapt and, and deliver accordingly, I think is something that, that we've all had to be extremely um, adept at during this period. Thank you. So Sarah, it's adaptability. In a word, thank you. Gaini. Uh, being there for our teams, I think we need to be uh, fully cognizant of the fact that everybody's got new challenges every single day. So we've got to be there for our teams and we've got to listen more. So it's uh, being there for the other person. Empathy? Empathy for the co-worker, Gany, is that right? Yeah, empathy, but I think it's, uh, yeah, empathy is a large part of it. But just uh, like what Sarah said, yes, now, now making sure we ask somebody, is everything okay? Not just with the work and the, and the task at hand, but is everything okay at home? Is everything okay with the kids? And so on. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Felix. Yeah, I would say the most strongest one was to, to be more resilient. You know, never give up uh, because it was a huge challenge. And uh, we know that, you know, the whole uh, society, a uh, uh, lot of people, due to whatever the reasons are, you know, against uh, you, against the business community. I think the thing is, you know, that uh, without understanding, you are still profit-driven. You don't look at, you know, how bad the situation is. But, you know, you have to not only uh, uh, resilient to be resilient only by myself, but also to grow my uh, uh, other senior managers, other middle managers, not only that, even to transfer this knowledge to become more resilient in day-to-day -day work, in carrying out their work, so that, you know, having that uh, uh, stamping in their, uh, in their selves, you know, that, you know, to be resilient and also uh, be, especially also be, to be honest, you know, to engaging and, you know, sharing, also be, to be a good communicator. But I would say out of all these things, to be more resilient, that was the thing that I, I think I was able to... Uh, Honest during this uh, period. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. While we uh, come to the come to our honourable member of parliament, the audience also can uh, put in the chat box the leadership trait that you have developed during the past time, so we can all see your traits as well. Yes, honourable um, Vikramaraja. Yes, so, yes, Sri, Sri Lanka has a very small population when you compare it to the rest of Asia. And therefore, uh, one realization I have come to is in a crisis pandemic, the people who are educated, the people at the top generally can cope with it better. I think we have a responsibility to educate every child in our country with a higher education, with a higher education, from all levels to a mechanical or technical education, from the A-levels to university or professional education. This is an achievable goal because a higher education will give them a higher value addition and a higher income and a higher living standard for the country. So it's not impossible. So when I think about the housemaid, when I think about the working person working in the garden or the person coming into the factory, I think about their children, not about them. Everybody could be given a higher education. Now, what does that mean? I have had to wash more plates in the last two months than I have washed in the last two years, but which I didn't do. But if I was working in London or New York, I will be washing plates every day. So that's nothing unusual about it. So I'm saying is, you know, a higher education, a value addition is a goal that we need to have. And I think we can achieve it. Wonderful, thank you very much. Yes, we have some traits that are put on a chat box as well, which our audience, have been working on as leaders. Uh, there is patience, innovation, influence, adaptation, organizational skill, time management, resilience. Wonderful. So great, we have had a very productive panel discussion where we have not just limited ourselves to a structure, but we have taken in almost every question that have been posed to us from the Zoom discussion and also from our WIM FB live stream. So very few panel discussions will be accommodating all questions. And also we have discussed many, not the issues, but solutions to the issues 
that everybody is looking <coughs> forward to have. And all the panelists have been able to inspire the audience with their experience, with their personal touch, and how their businesses, their organizations have uh, been successful during this time. It's a wonderful session. And the recording will be on the Women in Management YouTube, and it will be shared by WIM social media. So please look forward to that. I thank all the panelists, and I thank Women in Management, the chairperson, Dr. Slojana Sigera, for trusting me for this wonderful opportunity. And uh, we had a lovely time. All the panelists had been extremely responsive. I have had a lot of beautiful conversations with them before the panel and hopefully after the panel discussion as well. And the audience had been very supportive and they had been very engaging. And I'm sure it was not just another boring webinar. It was informative, productive webinar, just like all the webinars are. So look forward to the next um, Zoom discussion or the online discussion or the next event by Women in Management. Thank you, everybody. See you again soon. Stay safe. Good night. Thank you.